Tonight on The Readout... We've got the white Christian men that built this country the first time, and we'll do it again. You think you can replace us? You're wrong. We will replace you. That is Trump's dinner guest, white supremacist, Holocaust denier, and incel leader Nick Fuentes. Trump claims implausibly that he'd never heard of the guy before he served him dinner, dinner at his private home. But even after being told who that is, Trump won't condemn white nationalism because of his long history of embracing it. Plus, voter enthusiasm is through the roof in Georgia, with the Senate runoff deadline just eight days away. Meanwhile, Herschel Walker was MIA for almost a week. And we're still waiting to hear back from him about that debate that he demanded to have with me. What's up, Herschel? But we begin tonight with a very extreme Thanksgiving. In this case, a Friendsgiving meal hosted by Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago with guests Ye, formerly known as rapper Kanye West, and Nick Fuentes, an outspoken anti-Semite and racist who does a podcast popular with fellow anti-Semites and racists from his mother's basement. Here's a sampling of what Trump's dinner guest is all about. Our secret sauce here, it's these young white men. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we call the secret ingredient. America and the world has forgotten about them, but not us. This is going to be the most racist. <laughs> Whoa! Trump has since claimed to know nothing about Fuentes, and he says he didn't know who he was. He obviously does know Ye, who, let's face it, does not appear to have all the chips in his cookie these days, and who must have heard that, you know, Ye's been denounced for making anti-Semitic statements before he invited him over. Trump claims that Ye brought the anti-Semite to dinner, so you know, it's not on him. But he also reportedly said of Fuentes, I like him. He gets me. Trump? Dining with a white nationalist? Impossible, according to his campaign, as the meetup descends into a full-fledged public relations catastrophe. One longtime Trump advisor described it as, quote, an effing nightmare. <laughs> okay, are we, are we really going to play this game? As if Trump dining with one of the country's most prominent young white supremacists is, like, surprising. Remember, he is the guy who told the far-right Proud Boys to stand back and stand by when he was asked to condemn white supremacists, you know, before they broke into the Capitol. He also said this about the Unite the Right white supremacist rally in Charlottesville that left one counter-protester dead. You also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Very fine neo-Nazis, according to Trump. Nick Fuentes was at that rally, along with Richard Spencer, who helped to organize it. Spencer, a prolific and proud white supremacist, Muslim-hating propagandist, attended Duke with Stephen Miller the architect of Trump's Muslim ban and child separation policies, who now spends his time suing the federal government for helping black farmers. Spencer has publicly stated that he considered himself Miller's mentor. Let's just pause on that for a moment. The person who was writing America's immigration policy was allegedly mentored by an alt-right white nationalist. Oh, and that's Spencer's term, by the way, alt-right, which is basically a cleaned-up word for white nationalist or fascist or Nazi. Steve Bannon, who once bragged that he made Breitbart the home of the alt-right, was later brought on as Trump's chief campaign strategist. He then had a direct line to Trump and the Oval Office, thereby cementing white nationalism and nativism as key components of Trump's national vision. It's like six degrees of separation to a white nationalist, and not even six, more like three or one. Then throw in the Republican Party, and it's like, well, everyone knows your name. Two House Republicans, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar, participated in an annual white supremacist event organized by, wait for it, Nick Fuentes. After some backlash, Greene claimed, well, she didn't know who white nationalism guy was, despite appearing chummy with him literally on stage. And then we have Matt Gates, who hosted Holocaust denier Charles Johnson, brought him as his guest to the State of the Union. Gates then claimed that well, he had no pre-existing relationship with the guy. Just happened to have an extra ticket lying around for the anti-Semite in my office. Ditto on Trump advisor Larry Kudlow, who once invited Peter Brimelow to a birthday party at his home. 
Brimelow is a promoter of white identity politics on an anti-immigration website called VDARE that he founded in 1999. Kudlow said, well, he'd known Brimelow forever, just not the white nationalist part. And there you have it. The same tired excuse we're now hearing from Trump, who denies knowing who anyone is, denies responsibility, you know, denies knowing who David Duke is, but he did know who he is. And behind every one of these denials is something more sinister, this creeping white nationalism and its entry as a central part of Trumpism, which is now just Republicanism, as an alternative but mainstream political philosophy. We have known about this for a very long time. We've said it. We've said it on this show. So let's just stop with the shock and the hand-wringing, the clutching of pearls. Instead, we condemn it. We call it out for what it is. This is another very fine people moment. Very fine people invited to dine in a former president's home. Join me now. Charlie Sykes, editor-at-large for The Bulwark on, and MSNBC contributor. Mara Gay, member of the New York Times editorial board and an MSNBC contributor. And Dana Milbank, opinion columnist for The Washington Post and author of The Destructionist, the 25-year crack-up of the Republican Party. I'm going to go in reverse order um, to the way that I introduced you guys and start with you, Dana. Because the thing is, I, I think the, the only thing that surprised me about Trump having dinner with, you know, Kanye used to be a really good rapper, but now it's just, woo, West. And this white supremacist who, who is the media pretending to be shocked again. How many times are we going to play this game of pretending Donald Trump has not been trucking with white nationalists since he went down that elevator? Dana. I, it, yeah, it's it's so silly, Joy. And I think we owe Trump, in a way, a debt of gratitude here for just coming right out in the open. This isn't the white tablecloth uh, Republican Party. This is the white nationalist uh, Republican Party. Uh, this, uh, you know, we've been talking about uh, the overtones of, of white supremacy in the party, but it really is now uh, principally the melody. Now, uh, I, I suppose the good news here is as Trump uh, fades uh, ever so slightly in the Republican Party, he clings more uh, to the fringes. He you know, plays the QAnon theme music uh, at his rally. Uh, he's wrapping himself ever closer with the white nationalists. But the, the flip side of what's happening here is uh, you know, who cares what it, what why Trump's doing it? It's elevating uh, the white nationalists. It's getting them an, a national audience over uh, and over again. You know, you mentioned Richard Spencer when Trump was elected. That he said we have a psychic connection to Trump, uh, okay. and they've had that all along. And but it's not just psychic now. There's actually a physical embrace. There's a physical embrace, and they actually literally tried to overthrow the government for him, Mara. I mean, it, look. It's not as if white nationalists just popped up when Trump came along. There have been white nationalists in American politics from the very beginning. And there were white nationalists who used to be very much in charge of the Democratic Party. OK, the Democrats had their turn. They just booted them to the side. Then they became the Dixiecrats. Then they became Republicans. This is not like some magic trick. These people have always been with us. They just keep switching parties. Now that they have control of the Republican Party, I feel like there's this collective sort of amnesia that happens every time Trump does something racist. They go, wait a second. This, let me just read a non, this is a non-exhaustive list. Trump allegedly praised Hitler to Chief of Staff John Kelly during his Europe trip. Vanity Fair magazine claimed that Trump's first wife, Ivana Trump, the lady Ivana Trump, claimed he kept a book of Hitler's speeches by his bed. These are old stories from the 90s. Black guys counting my money, said Trump. I hate it. The only kind of people I want counting my money are short guys that wear yarmulkes every day, according to his own ex-employee. I could go on. This guy has a long history going after Japanese people, going after black people. He's been like this the whole time. I don't understand why we play this game of saying, oh, my God, Trump might be racist and anti-Semitic. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, Joy, I completely agree. And I I think and I hope that it's well past time to uh, for all of us really to stop obsessing over uh, why Trump is doing the things that he's doing with respect to these white nationalists and how the rest of us have allowed this behavior uh, to go on, have allowed a man who palled around with these people and continues to, to be in the White House. And I think Republicans in particular, uh, and you heard some of them starting to openly criticize Trump today, especially after those midterms uh, a couple weeks ago, it's really time for them to have some soul searching, uh, not that we can expect that from them, but, but really about 
uh, what they want their party to stand for and where they stand. I mean, every single member of the Republican Party, in my view, needs to be on record. Do you support white nationalism? Do you support Nick Fuentes? I mean, this is really a time for a roll call. I also just, you know, it's hard because we have to wonder, you know, we've always known that these people existed, to your point, Joy. They have always been here. The Klan has been around since redemption. And yet, you know, it's only recently that they are suddenly getting an audience uh, after decades of progress with a former president of the United States. You know, not since maybe Woodrow Wilson have we seen this kind of unabashed hatred uh, from somebody who used to sit in the White House. So that really is in and of itself dangerous because that sends a signal that normalizes this hate and puts a target on the back of any American who is Jewish, LGBT, Black. Just let that continue. So this is a very yeah, dangerous and moment.